Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhills.church to watch or listen to past messages. We hope that you enjoy today's message from God's Word. Welcome to Southern Hills and happy Mother's Day to every woman who is a mother, to every woman who longs to be, to every woman who once was. Happy Mother's Day. To the ones who miss their mothers, she may live across the country, she may live around the world, or she may live in heavenly places. This too is your day. To the grandmothers who stay young, and to the mother-in-laws who stay quiet, <laughs> to the stepmothers who aren't wicked, to the foster mothers who just won't give up, and to the single mothers who inspire us all, happy Mother's Day. Today is more than a simple Hallmark holiday. Today is a celebration of unconditional love. Today is a celebration of extravagant selflessness. Today is a celebration of endless beauty. Mothers, we love you because you first loved us. In each of you, we see an image of a different person, of a better person. In you, we see an image of another. In you, we see the greatest beauty to behold, and that is the reflection of our beloved, nurturing, compassionate creator. And that's why we see such beauty in you. Happy Mother's Day. Let us pray. Father, my prayer this morning on this blessed day in our culture, that we remember one of the greatest gifts you've given us, and that is mothers. My prayer is that we would also remember the great heavenly father, that we would see the great gift that he gave us, and that is Jesus Christ. And in these moments to come, you would allow us to see what you see. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. These last few weeks, as we've been studying Help is on the Way, a four-week sermon series that finds Bible characters in their darkest moments, and God shows up and shines brightly. We're in our third of four sermons, and I'm looking forward already to next week, the grand finale of this sermon series, where we're going to be talking about Moses and what do you do when you have nowhere to turn. Next week being our baptism service, what an exciting time that is, every six weeks when that takes place. Today we turn to the story of a runaway slave. Picture her there, this young 18, 19, 20-year-old girl sitting at a well in her darkest moment, her entire family, her entire society, her entire village having turned their back on her. In her darkest moment, she meets with the God of heaven, and her life is never the same. The sermon is entitled, The Perfect Image, for we find two women in this passage that struggle in projecting and obtaining that perfect image. So, a question as we begin, what is the perfect image? What does the perfect woman look like? Now, if you're a smart guy right now, you just looked to your wife and said, you, that's, that's the right answer. <laughs> but in a society that does demand much of children, much of teenagers, much of millennials, much of men, much of women, what really is the perfect image? Woman, or what is the image that we try to obtain, attain, and project? I mean, physically, the perfect woman must be physically breathtaking, but seemingly unconcerned about her physical appearance. Intellectually, she must be brilliant, but, you know, not a show-off. Socially, she's extremely friendly, but she also enjoys her moments of solitude. As a parent, oh yes, parentally, she is an individual who is a perfect parent, and her children are always well-behaved, but she is not a helicopter parent. No, not at all. Domestically, her home is like a magazine. Think Marcus, Martha Stewart. And this woman, when it comes to relationally, she's the perfect wife in the kitchen, in the bedroom, and in the living room. The perfect companion at all times. That is the perfect woman and the image we must not only live up to, but we must project to the rest of society. And never, in my estimation, has the pressure upon women been so high. My, my question is why? Where do we get this? Perhaps it's social media. Perhaps because on social media we always send our highlight reel and never the bad moments, right? I mean, your lunch that you fixed for your child was perfectly fine until you went on Pinterest. 
and suddenly you're not a great mother anymore. Social media perhaps might push this projection of what we ought be or what the perfect image of a woman is, or are there's expectations, trying to live up to unreasonable expectations of those around us. Perhaps we have to live up to these expectations, but they're not the expectations of others. They're the expectations we place upon ourselves from our own childhood, the dreams of what we long to be, and so we work toward that, and then we try to attain and project this perfect image, or perhaps it's childhood heroes. As a child, you saw the perfect woman or what you assumed to be the perfect woman, and forever you longed to become like that. Little did you know they too had flaws. And that leads us to our passage for today in the book of Genesis, chapter number 16, where we do see three characters who are struggling with their own image and their own identity. First, we see a woman named Sarai. Later, her name would become Sarah, and she's struggling terribly. Now, the reason she's struggling is because she's angry with God. Now, before you judge her, how many of you have ever been, made a mistake? How many of you have ever been angry with God about something in your life? At some point or another, you just were displeased with the one who made everything happen. How many of you have ever been there? Well, Sarai is. Sarah's very angry with God, and she's angry because God has not given her something that she had always wanted. Now, granted, God had blessed her with a wonderful husband, a huge family, a large staff, a lot of wealth. God had blessed this woman with so much. But the one thing she wanted at the age of 76, she still did not have. So she was angry with God. She wanted a child. We see this in verse 1. Read along with me in the scripture. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. None, not one. And in this society, it was not simply that she had no child because much of the identity of a woman in antiquity was based upon the children she had and the progeny she produced. And if she did not produce a child, that spoke to her womanhood. Now, Sarah, Abraham's wife, had no children. And she had a handmaid. She did have a handmaid. Now, this was one of the many servants, but the handmaid itself was a servant or a slave that would have been her personal assistant. Somebody who took care of her personal needs, helped her get dressed, helped brush her hair, was there to take care of her schedule. That's who the Egyptian was, whose name was Hagar. She wanted a child more than anything. But listen, based on last Sunday's sermon, instead of waiting praying and believing. She concocted a plan that dishonored God, damaged her marriage, and ended up destroying the life of another. The second character we see is in verse 2. His name is Abram, eventually would be named Abraham. And it says in verse 2 what Abraham does. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing a child. I pray thee, go into thy maid, go into my slave, go into my, my servant. She said to her husband, I want you to go and become intimate with my slave. It may be that I may obtain children by her. If she has a child with you, then really it's my child because I own her. Therefore, I'll own the child. It'll be my child. Convoluted thinking to be sure. Well, Abraham, out of convenience or out of lust or out of desperation... He takes what is not his. Instead of waiting, instead of praying, instead of believing, he stupidly agrees to his wife's stupid plan and dishonors God, damages his marriage, and destroys a person's life. But there's a third character in the story you must see, and that is Hagar. She is our focus today. She is what I want you to see. I want you to view this poor young woman, probably between 18, 19, and 20 years old. All she had done her entire life was serve this family. All she had known her entire life was to be dedicated to this troop of people. And suddenly, she is taken advantage of. Understand this young girl is a girl, a real person, a human, with dreams of her own, with fears, with hopes for the future. And suddenly she is told that she would become the second wife to her 86-year-old master. Look at verse 4. And the Bible says in verse 4, 
And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Abraham went in and slept with Hagar, and after so, she got pregnant. And now, all of a sudden, her hopes for the future and her dreams are shattered. She begins to hate her mistress because of what her mistress made her do. She starts to show her hatred. Here's a woman who was taken advantage of dearly. A woman who is struggling with who she is and what her future might be. I was riding in the car with my children on my way to school the other day. Uh, this was just this last week. We had SOS radio on, and listening to God's music in the morning, man. Just a great way to get started. And there I was listening to the music, and all of a sudden, the music stopped for a moment, and one of the DJs got on and began to talk. Now, I love the music, but I also like the DJs when they get on and say something spiritual. And, and so one of the DJs did in this Christian radio station, he got on and he began to talk about Mother's Day. And he said, well, Mother's Day is a wonderful time, and there are many things that you can give your mothers. You can give your mothers chocolate, and you can give them flowers, and you can give them candy, and you can give them a card from Hallmark. But then he said this. He said, instead of giving your mother one of these things this year, why don't you take the time, instead of picking a card off of the rack, to write a heartfelt letter to your mother? And I thought, what a great, how many of you think that's a great idea? And it's free fantastic idea. Why don't you write a heartfelt card or letter to your mother? Well, as we're driving, as soon as that was said, Scarlett, who's eight years old, speaks up from the back. She said this. She said, that is great advice. I don't need it. <laughs> I love that statement because it speaks to what humans really do. They can identify what great advice is and decide, I'm not going to take it. That's great advice. I don't need it. This Mother's Day morning, I want to share with you some great advice, and I advise you to take it. Freedom is found when you see what God does. Hear this, every man, woman, and teenager in this room, freedom and joy and love and peace are found when you see what God sees. You say, well, Pastor Josh, what does God see? Today I want to share with you in the story three things that God sees in the life of Hagar. The first thing that we see that God sees that in the life of Hagar is number one, what does God see? God sees what they've done. How many of you agree that it was wrong for Abram and Sarai to take advantage of their servants? How many of you think that's a terrible story? I thought Abraham and Sarah were like heroes in the Bible. Here they are taking a slave girl, abusing her, and then wanting to throw her out, impregnating her and taking her child. How many of you agree that is morally reprehensible? Let's raise your hand. How many of you agree? Sure. We would call it morally reprehensible. The Bible calls it sin. Absolutely. But we've all sinned. Sure. Let me state this about the passage. First of all, God makes it very clear God sees what they did. God knows what they did to Hagar. But let me be more personal in your life. God knows what they did to you. Sometimes we wonder if God sees, don't we? We never had to wonder that about our mothers. We know that our mothers always saw everything. How many of you had a mother or have a mother that sees everything? And I can remember, I, she would say, is, your, is all of your homework done? Did you get your homework done? Uh-huh. How about math? Mm-mm-mm. <laughs> how did she know? Like, how, did the, how do mothers know? Did you clean your room? Yes. Completely clean? Yes. Did you get the socks from under the bed? And I would go upstairs, and I would look under the bed and think, my mother is a superhero. <laughs> how does she see these things? But here's the reality. Our mothers are very knowledgeable, but they are not omnipotent. That is, they don't know everything. Here's the reality of God. He is omnipotent. He knows everything. What happens sometimes when somebody treats us as badly as Hagar was treated, we begin to wonder to ourselves, does God even know what they did? And the answer to that question is yes. 100% of the time, God sees. God knows. 
That's why he's the final judge. That's why he's the one who will really ultimately judge all things. He knows what is right and wrong, and he sees what they did to Hagar. Look at verses 5 and 6. And it says, And Sarai said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. The Bible says Abraham and Sarah begin a fight. And Sarai walks into Abram and says to Abram, The thing that I did that was wrong, it's your fault. How many of you are married? (laughs) How many of you have ever had a conversation like this before? (laughs) You know the thing that I did? The thing that I did, I did because of you. And that's exactly goes back to Adam and Eve. Now Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham, my wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into your bosom. I said, sleep with my maid. And you did. Shocker. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. When she saw that she got pregnant, she was angry with me. And then she says, the Lord judge between you and me. The Lord will one day know who was right and who was wrong in this scenario. And the answer to that question is yes. God does see who was right and wrong in that scenario. And it was not Abraham or Sarah. God saw. I was despised in her eyes and the Lord judged between me and between Thee. And look at what Abram says, this godly man. Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleases thee. He said, look, what, what do I care? She's your slave. Do whatever you want with her. How many of you have ever been in a fight and you said things that you probably should not have said? And in the midst of this fight, Abraham, the father of the faith, says, she's your slave. Whatever you want to do, I don't care. So Sarah is so mad. She's mad at her husband, who was a philanderer, who she gave permission to be. She's mad at her, uh, at her maid because her maid is, is, is angry with her. And so look at what she does. This is terrible. And what I've got to tell you right now, what you're about to read is a bit, I'm telling you, is a bit graphic for the word of God. The Bible says, and Sarai dealt hardly with her and she fled from her face. This is a gracious way of saying Sarai went in, and in the original Hebrew language, there is great vitriol in this word hardly. It means she tore into Sarai, into Hagar. Imagine, you're a 20-year-old young girl. You've been forced to sleep with your 86-year-old master, and then you get pregnant, and your dreams are gone. And now suddenly, the woman who told you to do it, the one you've served since your childhood, is screaming at you, yelling at you, likely cursing at you, likely saying terrible things to you. And when it says hardly and says harshly, the concept perhaps is even of physical abuse. Okay, so here's the question. Have you ever been lied about? Have you ever been called terrible names? Has anybody ever seen you in a very terrible light and let you know how terrible you are? The Bible says she could handle it no longer, and she ran away. She flees. The first thing we see in the story today of what God sees Number one, God sees what they've done. And my truth to you is this, according to the word of God, hear this, whatever it is they've done, God sees it. Number two, God not only sees what they've done, number two, God sees the future clearly. God sees what they've done, that shows he's omniscient. But God also sees the future clearly, which means that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere at the same time. This is a cool thing about God. Not only does God live in the past, he lives in the present, but he also lives in the future. How many of you are thankful to know that you may not know what the future holds, but you know the one who holds the future? Can I get an amen? Amen. And that's exactly what God does in verse 7 and 8. Look at what the Bible says in verses 7 and 8. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar by the fountain of water in the wilderness. Hagar runs out into the middle of the desert as far as she possibly could. She falls down at a spring that would eventually become a well. And she falls down by this fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain of the way to Shur. The Bible says in the next verse, and he said, Hagar, this is God speaking to the young woman, Sarai's maid. He asks her two questions. Now look at these two questions. Whence comest thou and whither wilt thou go? Here are the questions. 
where you're coming from and where you're going. Beautiful. God meets this woman in her great need and asks her two questions. Hey, Hagar, where'd you come from and where are you going? How many of you believe that God already knew where she came from? How many of you believe that? How many of you also believe that God knew, knew exactly where she was going to go next? How many of you believe that? See, the question was not so that God could get information. The question so that he could help Hagar. The problem is, even though God knew the answer to both of those questions, Hagar only knew the answer to one. She knew where she had come from. She had no idea what the future held. And so that's exactly what she answers. She answers the first question. I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. Where are you coming from? Where are you going next? I don't know where I'm going, but I will tell you where I came from. I came from an abusive situation, and I came from Sarai who beat me, who cursed against me. This is where I came from. And let me tell you, friend, though you may not know where you're going, only where you came from, the God who sees the future can tell you what your next steps are. And that's exactly what God does here. God shares with Hagar her next steps. There are two of them. First next step is that she is to go back into the battle. Look at the verse. The angel of the Lord said unto her, return to thy mistress and submit thyself into her hand. How many of you this is a little bit surprising? As you study this passage, God comes to this woman who's been abused, used, and thrown away, and then God says to her, go back. Does this surprise you? Especially as American Christians. Once you come to God, everything is going to be perfect and the battles are over. But the reality is, God has created us to live in the battle and fight through the battle. Sometimes God calls us back into the battle. Now, I do want to give a, a small uh, caveat to this conversation. This is not telling you if you live in an abusive relationship to go back into that abusive relationship. That is not what this passage is teaching. But there is an overall compassing idea where God comes to her and says, you know what your future entails? What it entails is to not run away from your problems, but to run back and deal with your problems. First, he says, I know your future. Go back into the battle. But secondly, I note your future. I will give you double for your trouble. Look at what he says in verses 10 and 11. He says in verses 10 and 11, and the angel of the Lord said unto her more, let me tell you your future, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Hagar, let me tell you what's going on. The child that you've conceived, he's going to be a great nation. You're going to have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and your people's people will never diminish from the earth. And God has blessed you. Go back into the battle, but know this for sure, God's blessing is upon you. Now hear me as we conclude the second point. Hear it. God not only knows what they've done, God knows the future. And though your future may include more difficult battles, God's blessing will be poured out upon you if you go back and face those battles. This is what God is saying to Hagar. We see in this story some beautiful truths. First, we see that God sees what they've done. Then we see God sees the future clearly. Thirdly, we see today God sees the real you. God sees the real you. There are two kinds of people in the world. Minimalists and sentimentalists. You say, oh, come on, pastor, which are you? I'm a minimalist. I'm not very sentimental, I guess, about certain things. This has gotten me in trouble with my kids. I'm just not that sentimental about a lot of stuff. For example, how many of you parents have received a lot of macaroni art? <laughs> how much have you saved? I know those who tend to be maybe more sentimental, they're sentimentalists, they do, they save these things. My mother is a sentimentalist, and her garage proves it. It's amazing. I mean, they've got stuff. I'm kind of a minimalist by nature, and I love my children. I do, but I see that macaroni necklace and I look at it, and I say, thank you, and I put it on, and when they leave, it goes in the trash. <laughs> you know the Thanksgiving turkey hand? How many of you know that? The trash. You understand? Homemade Father's Day card, 
That gets filed in section 19. <laughs> also called the trash. You see, that's terrible. How could you say that? Because I'm a minimalist. I'm not a sentimentalist. I just don't hold on to things. I throw things away. It gets me into trouble not only with kids. It gets me in trouble in life because I'll try to go back and try to find something later. And it's not there. I mean, that's who I am. How many of you are like, okay, come on, let's be honest. God knows the real you. How many of you are minimalists like me? Raise your hand. How many of you are kind of more like that? Oh, you selfish, good for nothing, <laughs> organized and clean people. All right, very good. All right. How many of you are sentimentalists? Maybe you've held on a few things maybe longer than you should have. Raise your hand. You're like, I do not know where that cup came from, but I'm going to keep it because I might need that. See, God knows the real you. God knows that I'm not very sentimental, and the fact is that does cause me problems. He sees the real me, the unsympathetic minimalist. He sees the real me, the prideful narcissist. He sees the real me, the flawed pastor. He sees the real me, the true lover of God who tries to be a disciple. That's the real me. And God sees the real you, even when others don't. Genesis 16, look at what the Bible says Hagar learns in verse 13. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. It's fascinating when you study the original Hebrew because you see the words that she calls God. There are several names for God in the Bible that you do not know unless you study the original Hebrew. The many names for God in the Old Testament, one of them is El Shaddai, one is Elohim, another is El Roy. This is the only time in all the Bible it's used. It's when Hagar calls out to God throughout this entire ceremony, and she says to God, you are El Roy, the God, El, God, Roy, the one who sees. You are the God who sees me. Though everyone else, when they see me, see what they want to see, when you see me, you see the real me. The one with problems, the one with issues, the one with dreams, the one with fears, the one with hopes. And the one with sincerity, you see. The, let me say this to you, dear Hagar. God sees not only what they've done, not only your future. God sees the real, true you. And that ought to give you hope. That ought to give you peace and comfort. Why? Because what others see doesn't matter. Listen now. What others see, it doesn't matter. With Hagar, they saw her age. She was very young. With Hagar, they saw her social status. She was a slave and oppressed. With Hagar, they saw, her, they saw her ethnicity. She was an Egyptian. It's mentioned three times that she was an Egyptian. That means something. With Hagar, what others saw was her function. She was to be used and abused and thrown away. With Hagar, they saw her future. And that was, it doesn't matter. She'll be, she'll be disposable. Now hear me. Please hear me. The problem, if you focus so much on what others see in you and you're obsessed with the way others see you, eventually you'll start seeing you the way they see you. If you are so obsessed with the way people see you, eventually you'll see you the way they see you. So if they see you as too old to matter, you'll begin believing you're too old to matter. If they begin to see you as oppressed and a victim, then you'll begin to see yourself as oppressed and a victim. If they see you as your ethnicity not being right for success, then you'll begin to see yourself as your ethnicity not being right for success as a problem. If, you begin, if they see your future as nothing going nowhere, you'll begin to see your future as nothing going nowhere. This is a major problem. You see, the danger in seeing yourself the way others see you is that we start believing and we start playing the role that we are signed by others. And what I love about this passage is that Hagar says, I don't care the way Abraham and Sarai see me because I have seen the God who sees me. 
And instead of seeing yourself the way others see you, begin to see yourself the way God sees you. Say, how does God see me? Oh, dear sister and dear brother, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God looks upon the heart. See, you say, but I am inadequate. God sees you as perfectly capable. But you say, I'm insecure. God sees you as perfectly secure in Christ. But I'm, I'm inferior. God sees you as his perfect creation, perfectly designed for your life and your mission. Look at verse 14, because it doesn't end there. I love how the verse goes on in this passage. It says, wherefore, the well where she called in Berlehairoi, Ber meaning, behold, this is between Kadesh and, 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 and Barid. What is this saying? Go back to the, the last verse there. He's saying this, the God who sees me, and I shall call the name of the place, uh, uh, and she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, thou God who seest me. This is my favorite part of the verse. For she said, have also I here looked after him that seeth me. In this old English, it's a, it's a bit awkwardly worded. Let me reword it. She says, in this moment, I have seen the one who has seen me. Friend, hear me. You will never be able to see your true self until you see the one who sees you. Have you seen him? Have you, have you met Christ? Have you been born again? One of the reasons you may be shuffling through life as lost as can be is because you're looking to everyone else and everything else to tell you who you are. Maybe society will figure out who I am. Maybe my own emotions will figure out who I am. Maybe my friends, there's a friend or a boy or a girl or a spouse or an ex or a child. Maybe from the child I'll receive validation. Maybe from the child they'll tell me who I am. Hear me, friend. No one can tell you who you are until you meet your creator. The creator sees you. And Hagar understands, I can't see me until I see the one who sees me. Do you wonder why we struggle with such insecurity? It might be, friend, because you haven't received Christ as Savior. He died for your sins. He was buried and rose from the grave, and now we offer salvation. All you need to do is receive him, and you'll be saved. And then that communion with the Christ gives you who you truly are. Do you see this? You say, well, I've been saved, and I still struggle with my security. Could it be we struggle with our security because we continually go to the wrong source for our identity? Right? I mean, before we get up and talk to our creator about who we are, we want to get on Facebook and see how many people liked us. <laughs> I'm not against Facebook. But when you're more concerned about your Facebook post than what God says to you in the morning, maybe that's why we struggle with inferiority and security. Do you understand? When your entire week or your entire month is ruined because there's this other single human being who is not happy with you, then where do you find your security and identity? I dare say it's not with your creator. And you're seeing yourself the way they see you rather than seeing yourself the way God sees you. For the Christian, I say, go back and spend time with your creator. You say, but I still feel lonely. Even I, you know, I, I spent three minutes in the Bible and I prayed something. Spend more time with him. The more time you spend with your creator, the less you'll care what the other creations think. It's true. It's a reality. I'm a mini minimalist. I really am. I'm a throwaway guy. That's why it may surprise you that I have this. You can't see, it's nasty dusty. I like dust. It's got some old tape on it from years and years ago. What do you see? It's a box? Oh, I guess it's a box. What do you see? Shoe box? Worthwhile, right? Something grand in here. Some of you sentimentalists are dying to go through this. <laughs> 
I am a minimalist. This is why it may surprise you. It does surprise me. It really does that I still have this. This is my memory box. I keep it upstairs in my, or de in my closet. In here, I have a uh, little frame with uh, the very first note from Heather says, love you. First time she said, love you. She had known me three days. <laughs> a few of the pictures that we had together. We met. This is, uh, these are, uh, we went to um, like a Scandia. You know what Scandia is? It's like that. It's a track with miniature golf and golf, 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 golf carts or whatever they're called. And um, we got tickets from Ski Ball. I bought these for her. She doesn't know. I didn't tell her any of this. She doesn't know I'm, she's in the other thing right now. Hold on to these. Some cards that she wrote me, some of them so romantic, some of them she's made angry with me. <laughs> All sorts of pictures. There's a picture of us when we first started, when we first got engaged. There's us. Can't see that. Maybe I'll put it on the screen someday. Pictures of her. I have magnets on the back of these because um, in the dorm room, the bunk beds were made out of metal, and so I put them up. You know, so I could see her and my family. I um, Thank you, yes. <laughs> There's uh, pictures of our children at different stages. I, what, what is this? Oh, hey, wow, we're getting fancy, aren't we? We're like a big church now, wow. Right. Anybody show? Okay. There's, uh, there's one. You can barely see it, that's fine. That's her when we were first dating. Okay. <laughs> Settle down. It was graduation, my brother's graduation. Now look, here's the reality. What they say is true, one man's junk is another man's treasure, right? There will be a day, I know it. My, my, my son is more sentimental than I. There will be a day I die it's coming for us all, folks. <laughs> and this box, somebody will go through. He'll forget that this son sermon ever happened. He'll be like, all right, what is this? He'll look inside. He'll see some pictures and be like, oh, that's interesting. He'll see some notes. Depending on who he is as a person, sentimentally, he might hold on to the box. Might not. Eventually, one day, there'll be a day when he dies and somewhere in some attic, this box, 100 years old, and somebody who doesn't even know who I am will go through this box. And all it will be is some record of history that somebody ne these people never knew. And it'll be trash. I'm okay with that. Hear me. What others see when they see this box doesn't matter to me nearly as much as what I see when I see this box. It means something to me. Do you understand? You matter to God not because of what others see when they see you. You matter to God because of what he sees when he sees you. He sees the one that his son died upon the cross for. He sees what they've done. He sees your future. And he sees the true you. And if you're a Christian today, you ought to spend more time with him at church and in private devotion so that you can rest in that security. And if you're not a Christian, you better get to know your creator through Jesus Christ today. Let's pray. Father in heaven. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connect at southernhills.church. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhills.church slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach people around the world. 